Uh, so this is actually three, three present presentations, two of which I already gave, um, that I've just kind of smooshed together, and it's like a history of how this thing came into being. Um, uh, so let's get straight into it. Pale, like I said, it's, uh, well, like Chris said, it's a um, DAG-based key value store. Um, it uses Merkle clocks and CRD keys. Uh, so let's learn a little bit about it. First of all, um, let's be super clear about like what, what, what the scope of this is. Like Pale actually manages the part of the DAG that's responsible for tracking user keys and their values. And, uh, and values in Pale are always just CIDs, and CIDs obviously link off to other data which may be stored somewhere Pale doesn't care. Uh, it's only managing the kind of the, the bits that make up the, the structure of the bucket. Cool. Uh, and so, yeah, you can mutate the pail. You can add stuff to it and delete stuff from it. Uh, you put, put uh, things in. Uh, you give it a root, the root CID of the pail. If you ever used like MFS before, you'll know that uh, when you add something to MFS, the root of the whole MFS tree changes every time you, you, um, you add something in. It's a similar sort of idea here. Um, but you give it the root, the current root of the pail. Uh, you give it a new key and a new value to put in and put will uh, put that put that in the bucket. Um, and uh, delete, obviously, similar sort of idea. We give it the root and the key you want to delete. Um, and so that generates a diff. And the uh, the diff is just the blocks that were added as, as uh, added and removed as part of that mutation, um, along with the new root CID, which you need for, um, for doing additional operations. Um, and then what you can do is you can kind of take those blocks in that diff uh, and do stuff like upload it to web3.storage uh, so that they are available over like BitSwap over, uh, via like Elastic IPFS. Um, you can do that if you want. You can put them where in your own block store, uh, whatever you want to do. Um, but that's basically what happens. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's, Pale is a library. Um, it's also a little um, uh, CLI tool that I built uh, just so that I could like see it in action. Uh, so let's do, uh, let's try and do a demo with that uh, now. It's so close. Um, Cool. Here we go. I'm just going to try and try and do that. There we go. Out of my way. Uh, I'm going to leave that open actually. Okay. Here we go. Whoosh. Um, is that big enough for people? Oh. Giving away stuff. Um, cool. Over, so over on this side, I've got my uh, like a pail which I can just list out the contents of. There's no, there's nothing in this pail at the moment. Um, but we're going to add some things. Uh, and so what we can do, I've got this. <laughs> doesn't matter what the values are for the purposes of this demo. So I'm ju I've just got a little script that will generate me a random CID uh, for everything I want to add to a pail. So uh, I'm just going to grab that. Um, and what I can do is do like pail put. Uh, and then give it a key name. I'm going to call it one, uh, and the value is just a CID. Like I said, keys keys are just arbitrary strings. Values are CIDs to existing data. Uh, put that in, and Pale generates a little uh, diff. So this is kind of what happens. Uh, th this is the CID of the Pale root before this thing was put in, and so this this block has been removed. Uh, this block has been added, uh, and that's the new uh, the new root of the Pale. Below here, these are the uh, these are the blocks, other blocks that were changed in, in the process of updating the pale. So in this case, because there's only one thing, we actually just, we've only got the the root node that got uh, got altered and changed, so it gets a new CID. But when uh, pales get too big, they start to shard, and so you might, if you change a value in a big pale with lots of things in it, then you might get uh, you might see more uh, more things uh, appear here in this in this diff, which is all the blocks that changed, which kind of propagate up to the root. So um, that's kind of how it works. Let's put some more things in. Pale put, uh, do, add another, get another CID for me. There we go. Uh, another CID. There we go. Cool. Uh, and then, then I can do uh, list out, and we can see that we've got. Uh, Three items in there. They're, they're lexicographically ordered, uh, so that's why they're not in there in the uh, order that I put them in. Um, but it does mean that I can do kind of fun stuff, like uh, list out with a particular prefix um, to just uh, list the things that begin with T, for instance. Um, and it can do that. One of the big things about Pale is that it can, can do that sort of thing really fast. Uh, so it allows you to construct your, your data in a way that uh, um, you, can, you can list out things really quickly. 
Uh, cool. Uh, so then, um, what is what is that like? What <laughs> I talked about the DAG structure of the pale. What does it actually look like? Um, I can use this fun command called tree, um, which shows me that I have a shard here, um, which is just a block. Uh, every, every time you see shard, you can think that's a block, and then it's got the keys and values in that block. Uh, so this is kind of not super interesting, um, but it gets more interesting when it does actually do some sharding, and I can actually. Um, force pale to do, do some sharding to make this a bit more interesting uh, by, uh, by tuning down the, uh, the maximum shard size. So what it does typically is that you keep adding stuff to it and it puts things in the block and when it gets to a certain size, the next thing you put in it, it will shard uh, based on the key that you're putting in. Um, so let's just demo that, it makes it more obvious. <laughs> uh, so pale put, and if I put like three, two, uh, uh, get another CID, there we go, and then I can use this um, handy command line uh, option, max shard size uh, one, and I'm gonna set it to be 142, the current size of the shard. So basically when, I try, when it tries to put something in, it will have to do some sharding to accommodate the new value that I'm putting in. Cool, and then so this now gets more interesting because uh, we've got uh, free CIDs listed here now because we've got, we've got we're gonna have two shards. We've got the root shard as well as another shard that we've just created. So we've got two blocks that have been created and one block removed. Um, uh, and then, uh, so pale ls will do what it normally does. Um, but if we do pale tree now, it's more interesting. <laughs> uh, so we've got the root shard. Um, we've got the a, a key called, um, called free, which actually doesn't exist in the pale. There's like free two and, uh, a typo <laughs> there, uh, and but you can see that what it's done is it's kind of found this common prefix to these two keys uh, and sharded based on that prefix. And if you concatenate the the, uh, the keys in this shard with the the, um, the parent, then you get the keys that are in the uh, the, the bucket. Cool. So that's how it, that's kind of that's kind of fail. Uh, that's kind of how it works. Um, I've got this uh, in here. I made a pail. <laughs> uh, uh, and I can list out, these are words in a dictionary, uh, 235,000 of them. Um, it, it's the words from, uh, if you have a computer uh, and it's like Linux based or Unix based in some way, you've probably got user share dict uh, in there. And it's basically an English dictionary from the 90s or something. And uh, what I've done is I created a pale where the keys are just the words and the values are just random CIDs like I said before. But, um, uh, so that, that's that, and you can do you can kind of do fun stuff like pale ls uh, dash p with a prefix, uh, and then list out all the words that begin with bat, which of which there are uh, 179 of them, uh, and it does, does that really really quickly because it's uh, because it's designed to do that. Um, anyway, so b b b b b b b b, including batty phone, which is um, not a superhero's phone. It's actually like a musical instrument or something. Anyway, who knew? Um, <laughs> So uh, that's, that's the words. Uh, and then also in that same directory, there's this thing called proper names, which is just names of people, human names, people names, names of people. Um, <laughs> just names. Uh, so there's 1,308. At some point in history, there was only 1,308 names. Uh, uh, whatever, anyway. Um, <laughs> So uh, the, the cool thing about this is a bit less, a uh, bit less uh, data in this pale. So I can, when I do a tree, um, it, 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 it's nice and quick. Um, but you can see like how a pale looks when it's got a bit more data in it. How it's done, it's done a whole bunch of sharding here, um, and you can sort of see how like it, it, it shards up stuff. <laughs> and you can um, so we got sa ah. Sabrina, Sabrina as a name, uh, and like R R Rudolph and Rupert, uh, and so yeah. So anyway, shards and stuff, uh, and that's uh, that's that's pale. Uh, let's head on back to just prefix queries at the moment. But it's totally like someone needs to write some code, or but yeah, you could uh, you. Because it's ordered, and, and you, so you, you decide what, uh, like, how, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so hang on, let's just turn off. This one. Uh, stop mirroring. Okay, got it. There we go. Okay, back. We're back. Uh, cool. Okay, so that's um, that's pale. So at the time that I did this presentation and uh, and stuff like these are the <laughs> questions I had. Um, why do we even need a bucket abstraction? Uh, well. CIDs turns out not super recognizable to humans. Like you can't instantly see a CID, CID unless it's like the empty directory CID, which is quite easy. Uh, but other CIDs, you can't necessarily know what data is behind them by just looking at them. Uh, so that's that kind of sucks. And like ironically, humans are the people who actually need to look at these CIDs and identify the data. So it's weird that we don't have this uh, this kind of way of naming data according to what is uh, what it is. Um, and like annoyingly, all like data storage uh, services uh, basically allow you to give names to data that you upload, so why have we just got CIDs? Um, so we want like parity with this. Um, why don't, so in the context of like creating a, uh, a, some, a DAG and uh, uploading it to something like web3.storage, why, why, like, why don't we just store a name with the upload? Well, actually with web3.storage right now, you can do that, you can give something a name, um, but that name is actually just stored uh, in our Postgres database next to the kind of the CID of the thing that you uploaded. Um, and that's kind of, that kind of sucks because it's, uh, that name is separate from that data uh, it, and it's also centralized in our Postgres database, uh, which sucks. And it's also not scalable because as soon as you want to list stuff out, we've got, we get a lot of uploads. Um, the, the, like that table, it's big table and we can't list out stuff like that, and especially not with like a pre prefix, uh, uh, query like that. Um, so um, yeah, we kind of want that name to be stored with the data as part of the data. Uh, so that, that's, that's one thing that, that would be cool. Um, so the other thing you're probably uh, thinking about right now is like, why don't, why don't we just like use um, UnixFS uh, sharded directories for something like this? Um, Good question. Uh, it's it, it's it's kind of complicated. Um, it does involve you bringing in like DAG PB, uh, protobufs, protobuf encoding stuff, UnixFS, understanding how UnixFS works, and encoding and decoding that data, um, and and also like. It means that you're storing stuff as UnixFS. You might have application data that's not necessarily files. Um, so anyway, the primary reason, though, is that I wanted this prefix matching, um, this prefix matching ability to be able to really quickly list out things um, without actually reading the whole shard. And with um, Hamped in uh, UnixFS uh, sharded directories, you can't really do that without like reading the whole thing. So uh, that kind of sucks. Um, I'd also like to be able to use uh, forward slash in uh, in keys because like why that that just wouldn't be possible with Unix FS directories, um, and then like I wanted to minimize block traversals and dynamically shard when when it's absolutely necessarily uh, absolutely necessary. We're kind of um, optimizing for reading, even though like writing is still pretty quick anyway. Uh, so that's that's why that. Um, my other question I had was like. Oh, man, every time I update the pail, the root, the, the root CID changes. How do I even like keep track of that and share that? And like um, at the time, I was like, well, I guess we could have like an IPNS thing. Uh, like maybe there's some central service. Uh, maybe we don't need to keep track of that root CID. Maybe like the peers who are operating on the bucket just sort of um, they track it and like send it to other people when they need to know. I don't, anyway, the the like nah. Uh, Needed to know, want to know that, uh, like how are we going to do that? Um, uh, and, and so yeah, these are the questions that I had at the time. Um, and the, like, but the biggest, the biggest kind of question I had was like, <laughs> how do we resolve conflicts? Like, because it's, it's nice that I can play with my bucket on my own. Uh, but what if like I wanted multiplayer buckets where uh, lots of people can be adding, contributing to the same bucket, bucket, deleting things? Um, what? How does it work when like two people are updating the same key? Or what, how does it work when like the uh, they're across the internet and like the order of events is different? Like someone deletes something and then someone adds it when actually the order should have been the other way around. Um, yeah. So. Um, Oof. Yeah, that was the end of the first presentation. Um, uh, but like, luckily, um, when, I, when I was kind of looking into this, um, I found that there's like the one way is to like just don't have conflicts. <laughs> um, <laughs> sounds pretty wild, but um, but like there's this thing called CRDTs, as I found out, called conflict-free replicated data types, uh, which kind of can kind of help with that. So. Um, 
next presentation, this is like a few weeks later, um, let's talk about Merkel clocks and CRDTs. Uh, one of the outcomes of that those previous slides was like this, this realization that like in, in a distributed multiplayer environment, like the order of operations uh, really really matters and as well as the complex. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is and then show you how uh, Merkle clocks and CRDTs can, uh, can address the issues. So um, let's consider a fruit basket. Uh, it's a, just a pail with uh, three players. We've got Alice, Bob, and Carol. And what they're gonna do is they're all gonna add fruits uh, at approximately the same uh, time. And we're gonna look at this from Alice's point of view first. So Alice will put an apple in the fruit basket, then a banana. Uh, then she'll see that Bob puts a kiwi in, and then she sees that Carol put a mango in. Then she sees Bob put an orange in, and then finally um, Alice puts a pear in the fruit basket, so there's lots of fruit in there, that's great. Um, but Bob, uh, maybe due to network latencies, sees a slightly uh, different order of events. So Bob sees Alice put that apple in first, but then he puts his kiwi in, uh, then he puts his orange in, then he sees Carol put a mango in, then he sees Alice put a banana in, and then finally he sees Alice put a pair in. So we actually ended up with the same operations, but they arrived in, um, in different orders. And so you can imagine how that might be problematic um, if like Alice or Bob or Carol were to put or delete items with uh, conflicting keys. And these are not conflicting, but um, you, get, you get the idea. Um, but why, why is this a problem? Why don't we just have uh, like timestamps um, and, and just timestamp these events uh, and then sort them when we, when we receive them according to the timestamp. Well, um, not every player can be perfectly synchronized to a global time. Um, it's also really easy to spoof. You could set a far future time and then always get your thing uh, applied to the bucket regardless. Um, and that can be, uh, that sort of thing can be problematic in a trustless distributed system. So we don't really want to do that. Um, there's also the, the problem of like in pale, aside from the problem of key conflicts, um, we actually can't receive uh, events in a random order for this other reason, which is um, like the order of applied mutations to a pale determines the structure of the DAG that is generated. So we, we can't really have events going in in any, uh, any old order, even if they don't co conflict, because we might end up with a different root CID uh, even though the pale contains the same keys and uh, and values. So you could get, a, a, because it shards as it gets bigger, if you get a, a new key, it will use that key as the, the sharding key that it shards off. Uh, if a different key comes in, uh, in a different order, and it reaches that same threshold, then it will create a different shard, and you'll end up with uh, two different root CIDs, and that's bad. <laughs> so we don't want that. Anyway, cool. Um, so anyway, there's a thing called Merkle clocks, uh, and they make use of the inherent properties of Merkle DAGs to encode event ordering information. Um, so uh, let's have a look at how that works. So this is the same, same thing that happened earlier, but we're gonna, what we're gonna do is create our own Merkle clock um, from these events. Um, and so what happens is that each player creates a graph of the events that happen, um, and they can create events themselves, or they can receive events from others. And so again, this is Alice's view of, um, of events again. All right, so she's just created an event, um, which is a DAG node. Um, uh, and uh, you can see it's saying that she added an apple to, an, to the empty pail. That's good. Um, and what happens is that each player in the, in the system keeps track of the latest event. So, um, and it might be more than one if two or more players op uh, performed an operation at, um, at almost the same time. So, so just, you'll see in a sec. Um, so Alice is tracking this as the latest event. So next up, Alice puts in her banana into the pail and she tracks this as her latest event. And the banana actually links back to the previous latest event, uh, which is the apple. So. There you go. Then soon after, she receives an event from Bob, um, and Bob puts in the kiwi. Um, he hadn't received that banana event from Alice at the time he added the kiwi. So this kiwi points back to the apple, um, and that's okay because um, uh, that, that's okay. That, Alice just keeps track of these two events now. Um, that's fine. Uh, then Alice receives an event saying that Carol put a mango. Uh, in the bucket, uh, and uh, Carol's mango 
uh, does not point to Alice's banana. Uh, uh, so we, w what we know about that is that Carol went, like when Carol created her mango event, she hadn't received Alice's banana event because she it's not pointing back to it. Um, and now Alice's two latest events are the banana and the mango. Cool. Uh, and then Alice <laughs> receives another event from Bob. Um, he's put in an orange. Unbelievably, an incredible turn of events. Um, uh, it, was, it happened before Bob knew about the banana or the mango. What are the chances? Um, but anyway, now Alice, <laughs> Alice is tracking three latest events, uh, the banana, orange, and the mango. So that's that. And then finally, Alice adds that third item, uh, her third item, the pear, and the pear just links actually links back to those three events that she was previously um, tracking. And so now she starts to track her own new event as the single latest event. Um, so then like, uh, you can see that the, this graph that we've created will always be the same. Like, it doesn't really matter in which order we receive these events. We will always end up with this graph. Um, and you can even miss events entirely. Like I, I could... Um, a, like miss a kiwi and then receive a different one and just sort of discover, ambiently discover an event because some other event that I've received links to it. So it's kind of fun. Um, all right, so what can we say about the um, order of the events here? We actually, due to the DAG that we've created, we've got some kind of partial order here. Um, we know for sure that the apple was added first and the pear was added last. Um, the banana was added <laughs> around the same time as the kiwi, the, uh, the orange, and the mango, um, but we don't know if it was after or before or somewhere in the middle. Um, but it was definitely added uh, after, um, after the apple uh, but, and before the pear. Uh, orange and mango both came after the kiwi, but we don't know which one of those came first. Uh, and then finally, we know that the kiwi came after the apple, and the pear uh, and, and the pear came after the orange and the mango on that side, and also the after the banana. Um, cool. So, do we have an order of events? Mostly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Not really, right? Um, uh, we have like we have a bunch of unknowns. We have some ordering information, so that's kind of that kind of sucks. How do we resolve the order of these events uh, unambiguously? Well, um, one thing we can do is that we can order by waiting waiting the nodes. Uh, we can give the the uh, like start from the top and um, and work our way down to the common uh, common ancestor for, from all of these events and assign them each a a, a weight. Uh, we can have zero ones twos and, and threes as, as you walk down the tree. Um, and then you sort of end up with something that looks like this. We've got apple happened first, kiwi happened second, banana, orange, or mango happened third, but not, um, but then, and then pear. So we still got something to figure out. Uh, so that kind of sucks. What, what do we do here? Uh, <laughs> We've, we've figured some things out, but not all of them. Um, one thing that we can do um, to resolve this is to uh, like order like by, by the CID of the root node of the resulting pale after applying this event. And then we get an order of uh, a, a kind of uh, or, a ordering that will always be the same um, for every player who receives these events. So uh, we could do that. Um, cool. <laughs> All right, so at the time that I wrote this, my, my next steps were something like, like this. The idea was to use, use these Merkle clocks and CRDTs to enable multiplayer pales. Like we'd, we'd create like a Merkle clock as a service, a Mac ass, as I, <laughs> as I affectionately call it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and and also because and also then um, use UCANs for authorization because because um, you basically don't want a uh, like admin party pale you you want to be able to sort of uh, ha delegate access to people to do read only or read write or write you know etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and and we were also building uh, currently or we we are building this UCAN. Um, based web free dot storage API, which is about to come out, uh, or has come out in beta, uh, but we're, we're putting finishing touches on. Uh, so it all ties in really nicely with that. Um, and then sort of if we have this like Merkle clock as a service, you can in theory like build any CRDT application on top of, uh, of it. Uh, cool, okay, so fast forward. <laughs> so we kind of reaching present day now. We've been, we've been building this thing that, um, that I'm calling W3Fuck It. Uh, it's barely even a, a thing. 
uh, <laughs> yet, but it is built on the, uh, the Mac OS, the uh, Merkle Clock as a Service, the Pale Library, which is what we've been working with, um, and the new web3.storage UCAN APIs, which we call W3UP. Um, uh, and it's it's like W3 Bucket is currently like a it's just a plug to the W3 CLI tool. W3 CLI just allows you to use W3 up from the comfort of your terminal. Um, so anyway, so here's how it works. Um, hopefully, real quick. Um, just like with, with the pale CLI you saw earlier, um, putting a new value updates your local pale, um, and that generates a diff, which is like probably the second slide I showed. Uh, so the diff is just a set of blocks that were added, set of blocks that were, uh, were removed and new root. Um, and those added blocks are then stored uh, using w, uh, W3UP. And W3UP, like I said, is the, is the new web3.storage API for uploading data using UCANs for authorization. Um, and W3UP does the, uh, the job of getting these blocks into Elastic IPFS and into Filecoin, if you wanna know more about Elastic IPFS. There was a talk at IPFS camp that I gave. You should go and look that up because it was great in my opinion. And um, <laughs> uh, and then so once the blocks are in Elastic IPFS, anyone can fetch the blocks that comprise the bucket uh, over over BitSwap or from gateways if they want. Um, um, and then the act uh, in in W3 bucket, the act of putting something into the bucket will actually cause a Merkle clock event to be created, like we saw with uh, Alice, Bob, and. Uh, Carol. Uh, so we created this Merkle clock event and we can send that event to the Merkle clock as a service, um, which is cool. Um, we advance the Merkle clock, uh, the remote rem <laughs> Merkle clock. Um, and then the Merkle clock as a service can um, like advance itself when it receives that instruction um, <coughs> by retrieving any blocks it needs uh, via bit swap. Cool. All right. So if we move that over, the <laughs> another bucket. Uh, user can come along and use the Merkle clock as a service as like this rendezvous point, um, and it can read the current head of the clock. Um, and just the, so the head is like just the, the the set of events that are the most recent events according to the uh, Merkle clock. Um, there, so it can read read those events, and then another one can come along and do the same thing. Um, but like the real the real beauty of this is that these buckets are also Merkle clocks, um, and when you put a value. All W3 bucket does is advance its own local local clock. So, um, so you can just push your clock advances directly to another node, um, and that's and that's all fine because of uh, Merkle clocks and CRDTs. Um, it all works out uh, because no matter what order the events arrive in, so you can push directly directly to other other buckets. Um, and then you don't really need that rendezvous point at all, um, provided, provided you can actually talk directly to, um, to other buckets, uh, which is kind of cool, right? Um, yeah, all right. And so then while I was building this, I was sort of thinking about these interactions, um, like how, how can I do this as like a, a kind of useful CLI that makes sense to people? And I was thinking about it in terms of like Git operations and like a Git push is kind of a clock advance um, and a Git pull is kind of a, a clock Head, get the current head, the events at the, the tip of the, uh, the the head of the clock, um, and uh, and yeah. So when you pull, you get the heads, and then do like a local kind of clock advance with the heads that you've received, um, and then the other buckets are just like Git remotes, right? That you can push to, um, and maybe the origin is the Merkle clock as a service, uh, the thing that you push to by default, like GitHub.com. Super cool. All right, cool. Uh, let's do a real quick demo of this. I'm probably way over time. I'm not too bad, actually. <laughs> okay, great. Let's, let's demo. Uh, let's mirror this again. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay. Huh. Why does it do that? All right, come on, how do I? Um, so it, here I've got two um, two CLI instances. So I can the uh, the W3 CLI. I can do a who am I to get the identity of uh, of the of the CLI. Uh, so the, you can see these are these are different 
uh, different identities that we're, we're working with here. And what I've done is I've already done the work, it's for the purposes of saving time, I've, <laughs> I've done the work of delegating uh, the, uh, the one on the right. So this is uh, Alice on the left and Bob on the right. Um, I've done the work of delegating Bob uh, the capability to advance a clock on a given uh, space as well as store things to a given space or, or um, bucket. So I can do like W3, I've got the proof of, of that. I can list out the fact that I have uh, store add access to this. This is the um, this is the bucket that we're talking about. Uh, we, we're using. I can store add. I can also do like clock head and clock advance. Uh, so I've got I've, Bob has capability to do that on Alice's uh, bucket. Super cool, right? Um, and then um, and then yeah, uh, so I've got a bucket command, uh, and I've also uh, I'll just show you this. I've I've, um, uh, I've set up. I've set up Bob as a remote. Here we go. So this origin doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Coming soon. Anyway, um, so Bob is a um, Bob is this guy, which is that that DID, um, and his Bob server. I've also started so, like you can do like a W3 bucket server, and it'll start up a, a kind of server for which you can push stuff directly to. Um, so they're set up as remotes, um, and on this one. I've got Alice set up as, as a remote um, on Bob. So they, they're both set up to kind of be able to talk to each other, essentially. Um, so anyway, the, the bucket is, is just, so this, this bit is just like the pale CLI I showed you, so I can just list out items on, in the bucket. I've got some test things in here. Uh, let's clear this out. Uh, but you can see that the, uh, oh, look, he's got 13 things, uh, and he's got 12, oh, anyway. Uh, Sorry? It's the same name? The same key for in, the, in a bucket? Um, well, uh, it, will, <laughs> the, it will do the, the, the clock ordering thing. And um, the, well, not necessarily, I think, because it, um, it will eventually, uh, if it comes to it, it will order by the, the C. I d if it's if it's the, if it's the same order by the CID of the bucket that um, that got created from applying that event, if they if they issue the same key and value, you'll end up with the same <coughs> CID. If they have the same key but different values, then it will order by this root of the bucket that got created. Uh, so it depends at that point as a last resort. Um, uh, anyway, uh, let's just, <laughs> we, 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 we'll do questions after. <laughs> If that's okay, uh, let's just get through this. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, what I'm going to do is just do like a bucket, um, bucket put, uh, and I'm going to put in like another item. Let's grab a CID from my tool. Uh, here we go. There we go. So that's gone in Alice's bucket. Bucket. Bucket put. Um, a different one. Um, another CID. Cool. So th this is actually the same bucket. I just uh, I left it in a bad state after practicing. It's actually the same bucket. They they should be um, they should be in sync, but they're not. But never mind about that. Uh, but if I do a bucket LS, I should now see that this bucket has uh, another two, and this bucket. Uh, should have just another. It's the same bucket. They have different things in them, and that's because they haven't communicated the fact that they've put they put different things in it. So what what I'm going to do is I'm going to push uh, this uh, uh, an event from um, from Alice to Bob, and what we, we should see is because we've both sort of created uh, created an event from the same jumping off point, we should have multiple uh, multiple heads uh, because of all of the stuff that I showed you before. Um, uh, so uh, if I do W3 bucket um, push to Bob, uh, what this should do is, uh, so this is storing two blocks, storing the blocks with uh, W3 up, um, the service, and then once they've been stored, it will push uh, the events for the Merkle clock uh, to directly to Bob, uh, and Bob can uh, fetch those events from uh, 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 you know, Elastic IPFS, um, but you can see Bob's head is now is not um, a single CID anymore. It's it's two CIDs uh, because we've got these two events that 
that Alice put an event in and Bob also put an event in. Um, and so I can do uh, W3 bucket LS on Bob now. Uh, and I sh yeah, so I've got I've got the key that um, Alice p Alice pushed to me, um, uh, and I should be able to pull from Bob as well. There we go, uh, and then then Alice should receive Bob's uh, another two key which we didn't have before. Um, super cool. And that's the pay that's the pale bucket thing, um, and that's that's basically it. Um, I also have the um, the code for the uh, the Merkle clock as a service thing, which actually runs in Cloudflare workers, so we can have this rendezvous point for people who can't talk directly to each other. But it's all um, d distributed off via UCANs and DAGs that are shared on IPFS uh, and key value store with really fast listing of prefixes. Um, fun times bucket thing um, for your pleasure. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and uh, thanks. <laughs> Question? Uh, how does this compare to the uh, to that older Go DS CRDT implementation under the IPFS domain from like a little ways back that uh, I think IPFS cluster either used to use or currently uses? Like yeah, I just one thing I didn't say is that uh, cluster uses CRDTs. Uh, it's got a, a yeah, CRDT block store that it uses for the pins that it receives uh, so that all of the nodes in the cluster can figure, get the right information about what they should be pinning. Um, that's still in use. Um, I don't know how it compares because I have not looked at the code. Okay. Um, it's, it's, but it's very I did, similar, at least in like architecture. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, I imagine it is because it's based on the paper yeah. that they wrote. And I read the paper and didn't look at the implementation, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so I've probably done this, the same thing. Um, yeah, probably this very, very right, probably yeah. similar. Oh, <laughs> the paper is well worth a read. It's nice and short, as papers should be. But. What will be the reason why you? And you were sending Alice to Bob and not Alice to everybody or something. What, what is the reason to do it like um, in that way? Uh, yeah, um, I, I don't know. I like you could you could think maybe you could have a push to all configured remotes that like it's possible. Like you kind of have to tell people about the block, the events in, in some way. And there's not really a well. You can have you could have a push to everyone. That's fine. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I was thinking the push to all would be like the, the normal thing to do, and I thought your case would be more specific, and I was wondering if the reasoning that. So like I mean so if like I think typically you might just push to this Merkle clock as a service thing, and then other people would fetch from that when they want. Just it's just similar to like the Git flow in in. As it is now, um, but that's just that's just the way that I built the C, uh, the CLI tool. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that um, necessarily. Like it, it's sort of the the pieces are there such that you can build whatever kind of CRDT thing you want on top of this Merkle clock. Um, but it, yeah, it doesn't like it doesn't have to be um, push to one, one to one to one like it is. Um, I can imagine it helps to actually debug everything because you can see what. Yeah, and and because it because it, yeah, probably works because it was easy for me. Um, uh, yeah, and because because I can, uh, you do stuff locally and then push stuff up. You can actually see that you can actually demonstrate this kind of mo like multi-head uh, thing much easier because uh, you don't end up like. Pushing stuff up as soon as you've done it, um, you you can you can sort of demonstrate it that way and, and see what's actually happening behind the scenes. Like if I put another event on this bucket, then I'll end up um, with one one. Like if I put another item in one of these buckets, like if I do um, bucket put um, with like this doesn't matter. Put another thing. 
I'll end up with like one head now, and this head will be pointing to the two heads that I had before. Um, and it's kind of nice to be able to demonstrate demonstrate that um, this one is. Is there a reason still. you don't generate events until you are adding something to the bucket? Put, you mean pushing it? You could create the deterministic merge of two events and start gossiping that out without any new yeah, yeah, yeah. I think pairs. I did. I did actually start. I did start that way. Um, but then it was quite nice to be able to um, just operate locally, and then eventually, when I'm ready, start like push stuff out for th things to be. But no, there's no reason. Like, that could, so you don't be, ban it could the empty like event. That. There just isn't a command for it at the moment. Yeah, right, sure. Yeah, you can you can totally do that. Um, I, I actually started that way, put it, would actually um, store the blocks and, and send them out, but then I, I didn't. <laughs> if it's not the right uh, kind of way of working with this, and that, that's fine also. So what do you store locally? You store all of the events in the DAG, or you store the generated tree um, like you were showing the first so you, uh, you store You just store the head the head uh, of the, uh, you saw like the, the root CID of the, the bucket, the head, your current uh, clock head, and that's about it. And then there's like a block cache for like the events that you've received. Okay, so like, the but, events but because are, we're pushing... this is my current root, and this is the roots that are parents of this event, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because we're pushing events into Elastic IBFS, we don't have to keep hold of them locally. We can, you can just get them as, as and when they're needed from the IBFS network, because Elastic is always on. Um, so you don't like you can literally delete your local block store and still have access to, to the bucket, because you've stored those blocks in Web3 storage. And then your events are signed by the DSP. The, the um, the uh, so y the um, the you can that says advance the clock with this event is signed with the with my did kit yeah yeah the events themselves are not but they have CIDs and that's good enough. <laughs> uh. Sorry, I uh, I missed the the reasoning for needing the shard mechanic. Like in general, like if you like, just take a literal reading of like the Merkle CRG paper. Like, where does the shard fit in into that model? The uh, the shard, sharding of the the bucket is um, at some because the it's one block. At some point, you can fill that block up and make that block too big for Libp to be a transfer. So, you so when you add a new item, it adds to the same block. Yeah, like it replicates everything from the old object into a new block. Yeah. So it's like n from the old block, n plus one in a new block. Yeah. You, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You'd have one block with like one key in it. If you put another key, you'll get a new block with those two keys, two keys in it. Um, and if that block gets too big, you put too many things in it, then it will um, create another block for one of the keys that is a shard, uh, which reduces the size a little bit uh, to accommodate other other things. Is that a cause a lot of duplication, like between blocks then? Or do you just like it's stop it, caring like about it, the it, old but it it, uh, They're kind of small. The, the shard size doesn't have to be big. So yeah. like there's some duplication, yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, but but it's it, the, the, the key here is that we like, uh, I don't really want to dedupe everything because I want to minimize traversals uh, it's because Fetching thing, like blocks for each item is is expensive, and if I can just get blo one block with everything in it, then that's that's faster than um, getting a block, asking for a block, getting a block, decoding it, getting the next block, decoding it. Like if I do that for every, uh, like if it's a deep shard, then it's not so much, it's not so good. All right, thanks everyone. Uh